All right. Now, I brought this up in a sermon recently. I don't remember if it was this week or last week, but I'm going to be preaching on the subject of Christian prepping. So you hear about the preppers and being prepared and prepping. And I want to start off, if, well, we started reading in 1 Samuel 7, flip if you would to John chapter number 16, because there's a couple verses here I just want to read. Being prepared is always a good thing. Being prepared is a good thing. I, I definitely want to make sure people don't misunderstand what I'm trying to teach when it comes to this subject, because there's things taken, I think, to the extreme on the wrong ends, kind of on both sides of, of an issue this when it comes to like being prepared and prepping and stuff like that and I don't want to be misunderstood at all I'm really going to try my best to, to try to teach this subject as clearly and as thoroughly as I can but I also think that there is a lot of where just too much focus is spent on the physical nature of being prepared for things and people could just really invest and spend way too much time focusing on those things and w what we need is the proper balance the right thing we're going to start off with john 16 jesus christ said these words verse number one these things have i spoken unto you that ye should not be offended they shall put you out of the synagogues yea the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth god service and these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So Jesus gives warning. We receive warnings from the scripture. We have the revelation. We are given and we're told things to come. And the reason why is so we could be prepared. So that when these things come, he's saying, don't be offended. When this comes, I don't want this to take you by surprise. So he's saying, I'm going to tell you right up front, this is what's going to happen. Because when things take you by surprise, unfortunately what happens is people end up not making very wise decisions. When you know in advance what you're getting into, you have time to think about it, meditate on it, research it, look it up in the Bible, do whatever you need to do to kind of come up with, okay, what am I going to do in this situation? Perfect example of this, you know, with, with my wife and I, we got married, we were both a, a little bit older, late 20s, you know, and, um, or me, I was early 30s. But um, when it came to having children, we both knew what we know. Okay, um, well, I did a little bit more of the pushing, I think, at first. But uh, I'm sure my wife would tell you that she's very happy with the route that we went. But we, you know, I did a lot of research into having kids and, you know, vaccinations and home birth, hospital birth, with all this stuff, right? You look up all these things. But then... You know, something out of plan happened. <laughs> something that, that wasn't supposed to happen. Now we find ourselves in a whole new situation. So it's like, oh no, now we're going to the hospital. Now this is happening. Now. And, and just the, the, the uncertainty and the chaos can cause you to start to fear or to maybe rely on, on you, then you, you're forced to rely on other people. We, it, it's, it, as well as you possibly can, it's good to be well prepared and think of all the circumstances that you might be able to come up with, right? To, to be prepared. Now, no one is ever going to be 100% prepared for everything that's gonna happen in life. That's life, right? You have to deal with things that happen in life. Ideally though, You'd have all the information that you need to make decisions. Ideally, when your car breaks down, you already know a lot about vehicles. And you go, oh, I could just fix this. I know what the problem is right here. We'll get this taken care of right away. Or whatever the case may be, right? But we don't live in that ideal world. You're never going to know everything. So being prepared is good. Jesus Christ is warning his disciples. He's warning us. He's letting us know, hey, these things are going to happen so that you don't just get taken by surprise. It's great to know that there's a hurricane headed towards the coast. Why? Because it gives people time to prepare. It's not just going to hit them just boom, all of a sudden you wake up, you know, you go to bed yesterday, seems like a nice day. The next day, start with some storms start rolling in, which is like, oh, it looks like we have some storms. And then boom, you're getting hit with a hurricane, right? And, and, and it's really, really bad. It's nice to have that warning. It's nice to know in advance and to be able to prepare. Those are great things. I'm all for it. Prepare. Have, you know, if you're going to stay, roll out the storm, have the water and the food and, the, and your shelter secured and for, you know, everything ready to go. I think that's a good thing to do. It's wise. It just makes sense. You don't even need someone preaching you to tell you that, yeah, that makes sense. 
we get it. But people can end up going really, really overboard and over the top when it comes to a lot of this stuff. And unfortunately, a lot of that comes from just, really it comes from a deep-seated fear. We don't have to be afraid. And here's the thing, I'm gonna go through the preparations that we as Christians ought to go through. And I've prioritized them in the order that I think is most important when it comes to us being prepared as Christians. Prepared for everything, prepared for anything. And it starts with the heart. More than your physical need, more than other things, what we need to have prepared first and foremost is our heart prepared to serve God, to do what's right. And as we step through these, you'll start to see why I put them in the order that I did. Because if you can follow these and get these down and focus mostly on the first one and, mostly, and then on the second one and the third one, you're going to find out that by the end of it, the last one of just like being prepared physically for stuff, it, it's, it, it totally falls in at that, that lower, lower priority. And we'll see that. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. You'll understand more what I'm talking about when we get into this. So it, number, point number one, we need to prepare our hearts. That is of utmost priority. I mean, think about this. I mean, even just with salvation, right? You need to, to receive Christ as your Savior. You have to put your heart, your trust on Jesus Christ. You can have all of the physical wealth and goods and everything else in the whole world, and if you don't prepare your heart to put your faith on Jesus Christ, it's not going to do you any good. You can survive all the disasters. You can survive all the economic collapses. You can survive whatever is going to come your way on this earth, but at the end of the day, you're still going to die and your soul is going to go somewhere, right? That's the most obvious yeah, of course, we need to get our hearts right and prepared to, to be, you know, confronted with the Lord when we die. And the way to do it is we put our faith in Jesus Christ. But even more than that, as a, as a believer, we need to have our hearts prepared unto the Lord. Look at 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7 where we started here. Verse number 3, the Bible says, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord your God, excuse me, unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth that are among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So what's happening here is that the Philistines are scaring the children of Israel because they're coming up against them and they were going to you know, destroy them, invade them, you know, whatever. And he's saying, you don't have to fear, but you need to prepare your heart to serve God and serve Him alone. Get rid of these idols. Get rid of these false gods. Prepare your heart to serve God only. And if you do that, God will deliver you out of this trouble. Now, He didn't tell them, well, why didn't you build a bigger wall? Why don't you have more armaments? If you would have just made peace treaties with all these other countries, and if you would have had more arms, and if you would have had more gold, and if you would have had bigger walls, then you'd be just fine in this situation. No, he's saying prepare your heart. Prepare your heart to serve the Lord. You know what? God will deliver you out of these problems. Now, is having a, a, a bigger wall a bad thing? Is it a sin? No. Is it a bad thing to have arms? Is it a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing to have any of these things. But the, what they really needed to focus on, what they really needed more than anything, was to, to get their heart right. That's the priority. That's number one. If your heart's right with God, God can deliver you out of anything. That's why it's number one. Because if you're, when you're trusting in God, He is our defense. He is our buckler. He is our our shield. That is the number one preparation that you can do as a Christian prepper. Be right with God. Trust in Him only. That is priority number one. I'm just going to read, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read a few other examples of people getting right with God. Because this is mentioned multiple times in the Bible, preparing your heart. Uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 27, verse number 6, the Bible says, So Jotham became mighty. Because he prepared his ways before the Lord is God. Jotham was, became a mighty king. He was mighty in his, in his reign because he prepared his ways before the Lord is God. Ezra chapter number 7, verse number 6, the Bible reads, This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him 
all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. So when Ezra is getting ready to help rebuild Jerusalem and get everything back in order, he was a ready scribe and the king just gave just anything he was asking for. All of his requests, the king gave that to him. Why? Well, in verse number 10, the Bible says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. If you remember from the sermon this morning, doesn't that sound like he might be you know, great in the kingdom of God because he was not only doing, the, you know, he's keeping the commandments and he's teaching them. And that's one of the things he did. He prepared his heart. He prepared his heart to get right with God, to seek the law of the Lord, to do all this stuff. And then, and then what happens? All of his requests are, are answered. All of his prayers, all of his concerns, everything that he needs from this king that, it, that they were in captivity to giving him what he needed to go back and rebuild Jerusalem because he prepared his heart. He got his heart right. That allowed him to do great things for the Lord and allowed him to, to be in safety. Because so, I mean, some of the things, he was asking for all this money and all this other stuff. He prepared his heart and he was kept in safety for bringing all that stuff to Jerusalem and get it done. Number two, so preparation number one. We need to have our hearts prepared. Get your heart right with God. Seek God first in everything. That is utmost importance. That is what's going to keep you safe. That's what's going to keep you prepared. Preparation number two. Look at Ephesians chapter six. We're going to read on the, the whole armor of God. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able, be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And he goes on and on about the armor. Now, this is important because it's talking about a spiritual preparation of putting on armor. And, it, and you know, we could, we could go through the same type of scenario of thinking, well, what good is your life? What good is all the physical stuff if, you don't, if you're not doing anything spiritually? If you end up having a waste of life, what good is the physical preparedness of having all of the goods if the spiritual preparedness isn't there, if it's non-existent. So we're going to keep going through these in order of importance of where we ought to be emphasizing our time and our focus on if we are going to be prepared spiritually. And notice here it says that your feet are shod. So the part of the armor is, is, is your feet being, being uh, dressed or have shoes on with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Even just preparing to preach the gospel because the gospel has been entrusted to us. That's what we're supposed to be doing on this earth is giving the gospel to the lost, trying to win people to Christ. But in order to do that, you need to be prepared. So part of your, your Christian prep work should be preparing yourself to be able to preach the gospel at any given moment. That is something that requires preparation. Now, the best way to learn is by doing. So I encourage everybody to go out, be a silent partner. If you've never given the gospel before, be a silent partner. But don't let it stop there. Get prepared. Prepare yourself. Prepare your gospel presentation. Prepare by studying God's word. Prepare by memorizing the scripture. What happens if you're caught off guard and you don't have your Bible with you? We need to be prepared by having the verses memorized. John 3.16, John 3.18, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, all of the different verses that you might use to get somebody saved, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Revelation 20, you know, go through all of the different verses that you might use and memorize them, commit them to memory and use them. Be prepared. Be prepared by knowing even how to give the gospel. Where are you going to go to here? Where are you going to go to next? What are you going to show people? All of that requires preparation. And we haven't gotten into the physical stuff yet. This is still, I believe, if you're, if you're going to be spending and investing your time doing anything and you're not a soul winner, before you spend your time investing on getting the vault and the food storage and the water and all, everything you need to get you through the three and a half years tribulation and seven years just in case you're wrong, right? 
Before you go through all of that, get this down. This is more important. This is going to be more valuable to you. This is going to give you more rewards and more benefit than just keeping your flesh safe for a little bit longer. The spiritual is always going to be more important. But notice, I say more important. This has to do with delegating your resources and your time wisely. I'm not saying that you can't have the other stuff. I'm not saying not to do it because all of it is wise. All of it is, is going to be using wisdom, but have the most wisdom to determine what's most important. We have limited time in general on this, on this earth and, and what are you going to spend your time doing? What are you going to focus on? And... You know, the older that you get or the bigger your family becomes, the more things that you do, you're going to realize how little time you really have. I could, I mean, with my free time that I have, especially now I'm starting another job, you know, what am I going to be able to do if I wanted to really have this vault or this bunker? I could, I could take every, every breathing moment that I have outside of those other things and just start building and building and, and storing away and, and, and burrowing and doing all this stuff. But that's going to come at a cost. And what cost is that going to be? Well, I guess I won't be able to do the extra soul winning time. I guess I won't be able to do this. I guess I won't be able to do that. And when I look at the order here, I'm going to say, no, no, this is more important. Having my spiritual armor completely prepared and ready to go is way more important than the physical. Turn if you're in Ephesians 6, flip, flip back to Ephesians chapter 2. We need to be prepared to work as believers. You know, we don't, we don't just receive the free gift and be like, woohoo, all right, I got a free gift. I'm going to heaven. I'm going off the party. See you later. Have a good life. And just live the rest of your days. Just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's not what it's all about. You get saved. Now it's, you know what? Get ready to roll up your sleeves and do some work. Be prepared to work because that's what God has us here to do. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. Of course, verses 8 and 9 are the very famous salvation verses that we use. But verse number 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God says, I want you working. You're my workmanship. I created you. I want you now doing the works that I have before you to do. Get the works done. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, turn if you would to 1 Chronicles chapter 22. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. God's called us to work. The, what the, and this passage lines up perfectly with what we we're already looking at this morning, saying, you know, we've seen this before, whether you sleep or wake, you know, if you're in Christ, we see here, you know, in a, in a great house, there's a vessel of gold and silver and also wooden of earth. And we see at the judgment seat of Christ that some people are going to have works of, of wood, hay, and stubble. And they're just going to get burned up, but they're still saved. I mean, they're still going to heaven. And then other people are going to have, you know, gold, silver, precious stones, and they're going to abide, and you're going to get reward for that. And he's saying here, in a great house, you're going to have people doing both. You're going to have some people who are actually doing something that's worth something to God, that God wants you doing, investing your time wisely. And then you're going to have other people who are saved, but they're really not spending their time very wisely. It just would, hey, we all... If you want to be a vessel unto honor, though, if you don't want to be just, this, just a vessel unto dishonor, he says, purge yourself from these, be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, which means set apart, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. You're going to need to start getting the sin out of your life to be used more and more and more by God. Prepare yourself to be used of God. Prepare to do the work. If you're going to prepare to do work for the Lord, guess what you have to do? You have to prepare to set aside time to do work for the Lord, not just expecting God to just somehow magically change your schedule for you. I mean, I wouldn't, if God has to go in and change your schedule for you, it's probably not going to be very pleasant for you. If he says, hey, son, I want you to work for me today. 
and you've just got too many other things going on in your life. Because if God really wants you to do the work, he can make sure that you end up with the time to serve him. But if you have to wait for him to make sure that you're going to have the time to do it, it may not be the way you want it to happen. It may not be the most pleasant way. We want to make sure that, that we are ahead of the game, that we've got our heart right with God, that we've got, we're prepared our heart to serve him, we're prepared to do the work, and we are preparing to do everything that he wants us to do, uh, prepared on every good work. We also ought to be preparing our children. Look in 1 Chronicles chapter 22. We're going to see David prepared all that he could for Solomon to succeed at the work that he had to do. He's not only, you know, preparing himself to work, he's preparing his son to be able to do the work of the Lord and getting ready for him. That is valuable to him. Now you could get some overlap here, right? As you're preparing to, to supply your children with the best advantage they can possibly have to grow up and do even more works than you ever were able to do. You know, there might be some other things that go along with that that you just happen to get prepared along the way. Now, what, so what I mean is like um, we see here with, you know, even in my life, I, I think of my children and I'm really thankful that I had gotten right with God and started doing the work before they were born because now they're getting an advantage that I never really had because I didn't, you know, I grew up unsaved. So now they're going to be getting, you know, they're not going to be allowed to listen to all the music I was allowed to listen to. They're not able to get into nearly the amount of worldly stuff that I was involved in that kind of led me on a bad path and caused a lot of other things to happen in my life that I wish never happened. But they've got a better start. So I'm going to be preparing them, not only preparing myself to work, but through my preparation to work, I'm going to be preparing them to get even more done. I want them to have more knowledge. I want them to understand the Bible more. I want them to have a good prayer life. I want them to have all of these things ready to go. So that way, when they're old enough to do their own work, they can excel and do 10 times more than I've ever done. Because they've been prepared, and it's important for us to think about the future and prepare our children to do the work. David had the same mentality. He wanted to do this great work for God. He wanted to do everything. God said, no. He said, okay, well, I'm going to prepare my son to do it then. I'm going to make sure he has everything just at his disposal, ready to go. No reason for him to fail. If he fails, it would be really difficult for, you know, we want to make it so our kids, it's going to be really difficult for them to fail and easy to succeed because we've worked hard enough to prepare them to keep going. I mean, we don't know. You think about a, a lot of this has to do with because we feel like we're in the last times, right? Christian prepping. We see a lot of people prepping for all the disasters and stuff. We really don't know. I mean, do I believe we're in the last times? Yes, I do. Do I think we're going to see Jesus Christ return in my generation? Probably. I think that I'll still be alive when he comes back. But I don't know that. I don't know that. I'm going to work as hard as I would, assuming that he may be coming back very, very soon. But I'm also going to work with the understanding that maybe my children will live their lives out before he comes back. So on having that understanding, I'm going to make sure they're as well prepared as possible to go through everything that I think we will probably end up going through. That they're even better prepared. And the way that they're going to be the best prepared is spiritually because it is a spiritual fight. It's a spiritual battle. 1 Chronicles 22, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel. And he set masons to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors of the gates, and for the joinings, and brass in abundance without weight. Also cedar trees in abundance for the Zidonians, and they of Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender. And the house that is to be builded for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent, of fame and of glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. And I think that was a very wise investment of his preparation to, to do, as, to, to maximize the work that Solomon had to do. And he says, you know what, this needs to be unlike anything else. So I need to get my son prepared with everything that he's going to possibly need to do this great work for the Lord. So number one, we need to prepare our hearts just to, to serve God and to be right with God. Number two, we need to be prepared to preach the gospel. 
preparation of having the full armor of God and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number three, we need to be prepared to work. And prepared to work hard. Not just treating life as it's a vacation and living from just vacation to vacation to vacation, just always focused on how you can just enjoy life and not, and, and not really care about the work or feel like the work's a drudgery. No, we need to be ready to work. And the funny, the, the interesting thing is if you, if you have your heart prepared with God, if you are prepared to preach the gospel, and if you already are prepared to work and you're a hard worker, all of those things combined is going to make the necessity of you being prepared for your physical needs almost non-existent. The hard workers, no matter where you're at, if you're a hard worker, you're going to be resourceful and be able to, to find a way and figure out a way to get by just by being a hard worker, just by being, if you're right with God, we've, I've covered this many times in previous sermons, how God's not going to suffer the righteous to go hungry. You're not going to be begging bread. He's promised that. He's promised to clothe and to feed us. How much do you believe that promise? And we're at the end of the sermon where we turn a passage where he just spells it out. And, you know, I understand people getting upset when I, when I, when I preach some of these sermons because I really don't think, as I do, you know, there's wisdom in being prepared. There's wisdom in having some things. Like, I think it's wise to have a little bit of extra money saved up and a little bit of extra food saved up so you could lose your job, you could, you know, whatever. You could, you could help to sustain you through difficult times. It's a wise thing to do, but it is not a wise thing to just eat up very much of our attention at all. Because you can go through this life serving the Lord and being right with God, working hard, preaching the gospel, and not have anything in your pantry, and God would take care of you every single day of your life. If you're working hard for Him and, and serving Him and just in, in doing what He said there, you will be cared for every single day. And I think you can have confidence in that. And I don't think you have to fear going, I don't know, will God take care of me? When he's told us over and over and over and over again in the scripture that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to worry. Think not on the things of tomorrow. The things of tomorrow will take care of the things of itself. You don't have to worry about this stuff. It's not something that he wants us stressing out about and, and being so overly concerned about that it, that it eats up our time and our focus and our energy. It's not what he wants us to do. Now, Again, we're going to see some things here in the Bible. I'm going to bring up a few Bible verses that, um, for preparing for physical needs. Because there is. Obviously, you need to be able to take care of your own household, the Bible says. If, you, you know, if you're not able to care for your own, especially those of your own household, you're worse than an infidel. So we need to provide for our own. Men need to go out to work and support and feed their family. That's something that we're supposed to do. And that's why it says wise to be able to, to have some more stuff piled away for the rainy day when, when things aren't going well to also be able to provide for your family. But the best provision you're going to have is by doing steps one, two, and three. Getting your heart right because that, that will, that's guaranteed to take care of you. It's guaranteed to take care of you. The rest is going to be good for keeping you comfortable because God promised to feed you and clothe you. It might not be with all the food that you want. It might not be with, you know, he didn't even promise the roof over your head, right? So those extra things, the extra luxuries and benefits, yeah, that's going to be based on your hard work and being wise with what God's blessed you with, with whatever finances you have and, and making wise choices and not just being frivolous and wasting things. But look, um, turn if you would, yeah, we're going to look in Proverbs a little bit. Turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30, verse number 24. And again, really good wisdom here. The Bible says, There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat 
in the summer. So what we see here is that, okay, you don't have to be that big, you don't have to be that large, but they're able to uh, use wisdom to prepare their meat in the summer, meaning that they're going to be well fed and cared for throughout the whole year. So they're going to work hard in the summer, which is a time when everyone wants to take a vacation because it's nice outside. They're going to work in order to provide themselves and make sure that they're going to be cared for throughout the year. Now, there is something that, that we miss as human beings in the society we live in today. And it is, there, there is a, a loss of the concept of being prepared for hard times because we live in a society where you've got supermarkets and grocery stores right down the street. And if you run out of something, it's not a big deal. You just go just drive in your car and go and pick it up any hour of the day because you've got stores open 24 hours that have things imported and shipped from all over the world. And it's just like right here at our fingertips. And you could just go out and buy it and just be like, well, who cares? Because it's all good, you know, and, and we do, there, there is a reasonable concern that you need to be a little bit better prepared than just relying on that store to always be open because we do know there's going to be times of trouble to come. We, we've been warned about that. We've been warned of famines, but even besides what's going to happen that the Re revelation talks about, it can happen anyways, even if it's not the tribulation period. There can be diseases, there can be famines, there can be other disasters, there can be natural disasters that are going to cause you to, to go through hard times. So being prepared for those things is a wise thing to do. So again, I'm, not, I'm trying to balance out, hopefully you're getting the balance I'm trying to paint here, the picture of, of, of how much we need to be focused on these things versus you know, taking it to this level of just being way over the top. And, and worried about that more than you're worried about the things of God and, and where to draw the line. And, I th and to be honest with you, you know, people talk about storing up year food and stuff for years and years. I don't think we need to do that. I don't believe we do. I don't. I'm not preparing to have food and meals for, for, for years and years and years. I'm not investing that much into it. I think it's wise to have food and other stuff in your, in your pantry and be able to get through hard times, maybe months worth or whatever, you know, however long, you know, to get through uh, rough patches. I am not planning on saving up everything I possibly can to make it through the whole tribulation period with just everything already bought and paid for. I'm not doing it. I think there's better uses of my money than just stockpiling it away in a silo and, and letting it sit there. You know, the Bible says that in, in James, you know, um, how, how dwelleth the love of God? If, if, if someone comes to you and you have the, need, the means to help like a brother in Christ and you don't help them, how dwelleth the love of God in you? I think it's in James. It's either in James or 1 John. It's like, you know, if you have the means, great. Praise God for the blessings he's given you. And if you have all of these means, it's, I'm not saying it's wrong for, for just saving some of it and storing it up and maybe storing it up to help other people. But don't have the attitude if, if you see your brother in trouble now and they need help now. Oh, no, this is my reserve for the tribulation. I can't, I can't dip into that and help you out. I, can't, I, I don't have anything for you. Like, that would be ridiculous. And I, I don't know if I know anyone like that, but... I'm just saying that's, you know, we need to have our hearts right and our priorities right and not be so focused on, on that to be, um, to be over the top. But anyways, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We saw the, the proverb about the ants. There's wisdom there. They're preparing their meat in the summer. But also what we're really seeing about this, what I believe, is talking more just about not being lazy. Don't, don't just be flippant and lazy about things. Um, it's not, we don't see the ants stockpiling what happens if there's a, a famine next year. We see them working in the summer in order to make sure they have the food to get through the winter, but we don't see them just stockpiling for years and years and years. Proverbs 10, if you want to look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 4, the Bible says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. So again, it's all the contrasting someone who's lazy with someone who is um, diligent. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. It's, a, it's the same type of thing that, that is being taught here. Proverbs 21, 31, the Bible says, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. 
We're supposed to work and not be lazy. We should be wise with what God has blessed us with. Hey, if there's a battle coming up, you prepare the horse for the fight, right? You prepare the horse for the day of battle. It's a wise thing to do. It's a smart thing to do. It's something you have to do. But ultimately, God's the one that provides the safety. God's the one who we're relying on. So if God's blessed you with finances and with things to be able to put aside some food, great. But your, your focus should be on trusting in God to get you through. Your heart being right with God. You're prepared to work for God and preach the gospel and do all that stuff. See, what, what ends up happening here, what, I'll get in that in a minute. I think I have that in my notes still before I forget about it. But um, we see all throughout the Bible where God has preserved life, like um, in Egypt, for example. And this is one where, where everyone that's, into, that's really into the Christian prepping will turn to. They'll turn to the story of Joseph in Egypt, right? And look, there's a level of wisdom. It's, it's, I'm not saying this doesn't, you know, this is just completely off the wall or weird or bonkers. But the, the argument goes, they'll say, well, you know, God warned Joseph. And Joseph was wise. So during the time of plenty, he stored away the food to last through the years of famine, right? Because he knew it was coming up. So it was a good thing to do. It's a wise thing to do. Amen. That's exactly what happened. God put Joseph in a specific position to be able to do that, to sustain life through that time of famine by giving him that warning, giving him that heads up. That was good and right. But we also, and we should exercise similar wisdom. When you know things are coming, to prepare for it, right? As I started off the sermon with, God warns us about things so we know about it so we can prepare for it. We need to be prepared about the coming tribulation. But what does he emphasize more? Does he emphasize the wars and the famines more? Or does he emphasize more the persecutions and, and the Antichrist and, and what's coming that way? You know what I mean? Like, he emphasizes more the spiritual fight than he does what's going to be happening physically. There's not the, the, as much of the concern. Now, if we know what's going to happen, yeah, sure, we could do what we can to be prepared, but that's not the main objective. That's not the main battle. Think about those other times in Scripture where God didn't even allow for His people to store up stuff. Think about when, when the children of Israel were led out of Egypt. What did they have to eat? Manna. Were they allowed to go out and gather more manna on, a, on, on any day of the week, other than Friday, to go out and get and stock up and save more just so they didn't have to go out and, and do it again the next day? No. Were they allowed to just say, well, what if there is no manna tomorrow? I'm just going to hold this and just be safe just in case. No. It would, get, it would breed worms and stink and, and be good for nothing. If they, if anything more that they kept over than that day's meal. And he did that for 40 years. He told them specifically on Saturday, you don't go out and gather anything. So on Friday, you're able to have just enough for Friday and Saturday. And that's it. They couldn't stockpile anymore. They couldn't hoard anymore. They weren't in the best situation. They knew they were in the wilderness, but God said, nope, I'm doing this to teach you a lesson that you need to know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's why he fed them manna in the wilderness for 40 years. For 40 years. That's a long lesson to learn. God used Joseph for seven years to sustain life through seven-year famine, but God commanded the children of Israel for 40 years don't stockpile anything up. Just rely on me. If you rely on me, you're taken care of. That was the main message being taught to the children of Israel. If you trust me, everything, your needs will be met. You don't have to focus on making sure you have all of this stuff for your individual needs to be met if you're trusting in me. That was a, that's a huge lesson. Even when it came to, to God's law. We went over this with the year of Jubilee. Remember the years of Sabbaths. He told the land to rest. He said every seven years the land has to rest. Well, humanly speaking, we're thinking, well, no, we need to just stockpile then. Let's just get all of our storehouses built up. But did he say for the, the first six years to store up so you're prepared for the seventh year? No. He said in the sixth year, I'll bless you 
with enough food to get you through unto the ninth year. That's what the Bible says. That's what he says. He says, he never said, well, since you have to wait for the land of rest in the year seven, save up year one, save up year two, save up year three, save up year four, save up year five, save up year six, and then you'll get through. He said, year six, I'll just give you triple what you normally get in your, in, when you reap your food. And that'll last you. That'll last you through all the way up until you're able to reap again. That's what's being taught. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. I'm not saying it's sinful to have your own sorrows. I just don't think it's that necessary. I really don't. We should be wise with what God's given us. We should be, make smart decisions. We shouldn't just be flippant and just, and just you know, blow money on, on just a bunch of stupid luxury or whatever. You know, spend it for good resources. But if you were to do this, if you were to take whatever extra money you had and give alms to the poor instead of building a storehouse for yourself, I think you'll be in pretty good standing. Even if the tribulation were to start tomorrow. I don't think you'd have to rely on one of these other preppers. Oh, no. Oh, you're so foolish. Giving your alms to the poor. You should have been saving all that up. Now we're in the tribulation. Now what are you going to do? Don't know. But I know that, that God told us, Jesus Christ even said, you know, you give all, you, you know, sell that you have and give alms to the poor and you have treasure in heaven. I believe them. I believe it. I believe it to be true. In fact, there's actually multiple verses. Turn if you would to Job 27. There's actually multiple verses that state that the wealth that's laid up by wicked people will actually be consumed by the righteous. That people who, who you know, that amass all kinds of wealth that are wicked, they just do that to, that, that's going to be given to the righteous and the poor. And God, and God will make sure that that's, that's one of the ways he makes sure his people are taken care of. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, what did they do? They spoiled the Egyptians. They borrowed everything from them and, and basically spoiled them and took them and left. And, you know, they, they were taken care of to get through that time because they were in bondage. They were in slavery. They didn't have anything. They were real lean when they left. But God gave them what they needed to get through and he gave them what they needed in the wilderness and he continued to give them what they needed as his people. Job 27, verse 13, the Bible says, This is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors, which they shall receive of the Almighty. If his children be multiplied, it is for the sword. And his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread. Those that remain of him shall be buried in death, and his widows shall not weep. So this is talking about the wicked man, about God recompensing the wicked man, saying, you know what, even if he has a lot of kids, they're going to die. They're going to fall to the sword. His offspring's not going to be satisfied with bread. You know, they're going to come under a curse, right? The wicked man is not going to be blessed, even if he has all these things. It's going to turn against him. So continuing on in this train of thought, verse 16 says, Though he heap up silver as the dust, and prepare raiment as the clay. So he's got all this money, his silver and clothing. It's all stored up. Verse 17, He may prepare it, but the just shall put it on, and the innocent shall divide the silver. He's saying you could, he could save up all the stuff he wants, but he's wicked. You know what God's going to do? He's going to come in and say, yeah, you're going to lose that, and it's going to go to my people over here. It's going to go to these poor people over here. It's going to go where, where he wants it to go. But I saved up all this stuff. Doesn't matter, because God's able to, to, to change that in an instant. And that's why I don't think we should be focused so much on having that stockpile. Again, use your discretion, use your wisdom to, to, to help float you through different areas. That's great. That's fine. But the trust still, no matter what, at the end of the day, no matter what you have saved up, all of your trust always needs to be in the Lord. And you need to be able to at least realize that, hey, I may have this stuff here right now and it could be gone tomorrow. Thieves can break through and steal. I'm not going to be so, have my heart set on this being my reserve and this is what's going to get me through. No. Being right with God is what's going to get us through. 
you can have that stuff all you want, but don't let that be your stay and your focus on, on, on sustaining you. Proverbs chapter 10, verse number two, the Bible says, treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. The Lord will not suffer. It means he won't allow the soul of the righteous to famish. So when we read about the famines in the great tribulation and you're righteous, is God going to let your soul famish? Not according to Scripture. But he casteth away the substance of the wicked. Now, you know, I'll reiterate. It is wise when you know that there's problems coming ahead to be prepared for it. But that should not be, you know, let's, let's put the proper order to things. Get your heart right. Is your heart right with God? Are you preaching the gospel? Have you, are you prepared? Are you prepared on that front? Spiritually. Are you spiritually prepared with God? With the give to give the gospel? And are you prepared to work? Work for the Lord. You're prepared all of those other ways. Sure, accumulate this stuff and, and have that also, but don't let that take away from your, your spiritual battle, battle, from your spiritual preparedness because those are the most important. Because if you have those first three, you don't really need the rest. Turn if you go to Luke chapter 12. It's the last place we're going to turn. Luke chapter 12. It's easy to get distracted and caught up in all the fear that's pushed from the prepper community. I mean, I, I, I even got sucked into it a little bit. Or you start listening to Alex Jones too much. I mean, the guy lives off of fear. It's every red alert, red alert. You know, the world's ending. It doesn't matter who the boogeyman is. There's always somebody to just be like all up in arms and hysterical about. And... You, you, need your, you need your tangy tangerine and you need your, you know, sovereign silver and you need all this whatever, everything else that he has, all, all the other products he promotes. And, you know, it, it's designed to, to make you think you need all this. Oh, man, I got to have this stuff because otherwise I'm going to die. Otherwise, I'm just going to, if I don't have all this stuff, I'm going to die. No, no. Look, we need, we need to be health conscious. We need to be, you know, you ought to be self-sufficient. I'm a very, very big proponent of being self-sufficient, being able to defend yourself, being able to support yourself, being able to provide for yourself and be able to provide and help others and, and provide your own defense and do things like that. Everyone should have that independence and that liberty, but we don't need to be so just inundated with this fear that now we're just going to go overboard and it's be like, well, I mean, the government's coming, so I guess I mean my pistol's not enough. I'm gonna need a tank. I'm gonna, need, you know, I'm gonna need, I, I'm gonna need. I mean, this isn't enough. The tank's not gonna be enough. They got armor, man. I'm gonna need, you know, you can just keep on taking this. It's gonna be ridiculous if you follow it down that trail. It's gonna drive you nuts, and that's all you're gonna be doing. If you follow that thinking to its end, you're going to end up in some remote area, just way in the middle of nowhere, hunkered down. You got your food source. I've got, I've got my different caches of food and weapons, and, and I've got my, my retreat plan all mapped out. And if they come this way, then I'm going this way. And I've got my ammo store, and I've got my guns, and I've got my food and water and everything else. Man, I am ready. And you're going to go and you're going to live in the middle of nowhere and you're going to do nothing for the Lord. Nothing. Because there's nobody there. Who are you going to lead to Christ? And then, you know what? Maybe you'll just have a heart attack and die. And then whose are those things going to be that are just sitting out in the wilderness doing nothing and being used for nobody? We can't get so focused on it. You don't know what the day is going to bring. We need to live our life as if, we, hey, who knows? Who knows? Provide for your children, yes. Provide for your family. But 
you don't know how, no one knows exactly how everything's going to go out, but we do know what Scripture says. Are you in Luke chapter 12? Look at verse number 15. Th this is going to, Luke 12 is going to say this entire sermon better than I'm able to say it with my own words because it's the Word of God. Luke 12, but this is what I'm trying to express to you. It's found in Luke chapter 12. Verse number 15, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in abundance of the things which he possesseth. Read that. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Now, again, this is in reference to being covetous and wanting things you can't have. And you can apply this, rightfully so, to a lot of other things, just, just toys and goodies and whatever, things that you want to have and thinking that that's what your life is all about, just accumulating more stuff. Well, don't let your life turn into this big prepper thing of, well, I need to have all this and this and this and this and just have this abundance of stuff because that's not what life is all about either. Verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. So his ground is bringing forth very bountifully. God has blessed him in that, it, man, he's just getting all these crops and all this stuff to the point to where he's full. I mean, he had, like, like whatever he has for his, to, for his sustenance to store this stuff, it's full. And keep in mind as we read this, this is not a good example for us to follow. He says, well, here's what I'm going to do. Verse 18. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So he's got so much, he's got an overabundance. So what's he, what does he plan on doing? Well, I'll just stockpile even more. I'll just, I'll just build this huge cache of, of, of food here. I'm going to bestow all my fruits and my goods in here, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, I've got it all covered now. Verse number 20, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Verse 21, this is the key. He says, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And I'll tell you, that, honestly, that, that last part of there is the key. You know, the, the biggest problem that this person had is that he was not rich toward God. He did lay up treasure for himself, but the worst part is that he wasn't rich toward God. The first three areas that I brought up are about you being rich toward God. Number four is, is sure, you can lay up some of those other things if you want. Make sure you're rich with God. If God's blessed you or not, you know, the Apostle Paul said that, that you know, I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. God may bless you with, with money, with, with things, with material possessions. Great. Praise God for that. That's good. Don't let that distract you to no longer be rich toward God, though and trust in your uncertain riches of this world as opposed to just trusting in the Lord because you could have them one day and they could be gone the next. Either way, you need to know how to be a base, you need to know how to abound, and either way, just keep serving the Lord. Let's keep reading this, though. In, in verse number 22, it says, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on, the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. And, and this, I mean, I've had problems with this, ver with, these, with this passage so many times in my life just looking at this because there's the, the fitting everything together of being responsible and providing for your family and providing for yourself and doing what you need to do to work hard. But you cannot escape the teaching that Jesus is giving here about how important that stuff really is compared to what he wants them to do, right? He was, I mean, in, in so many other stories that we see and so many others I've already referenced today about God taking care of people who are there to serve him. He says, take no thought for your life. 
what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, the body is more than raiment. Verse 24, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowl? He's saying the birds, these ravens, God's providing them with food. They don't go out and sow the seed and reap the fields and do all the work, but they're still provided for. They don't do that physical work, but God is still feeding them. And he's saying, you're way more valuable than the ravens. And, he, and he's not saying for them to be lazy. He's saying, don't worry about that stuff because I've got other work for you to do. I've got the most important job for you to do. And if you're doing that job, you don't even need to be focus and get distracted with everything else. He says, I'll take care of you. Verse number 25, and which of you with taking thought can add to a stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to, to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And this is what he says in verse 33, sell that ye have and give alms. He's saying the exact opposite of what you might think of, of being, oh, we need to be prepared, I need to prep, I need to store up all of these goods. He's saying don't even worry about it. Don't worry about the food and the clothing. Do my work. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness that stuff will all be added unto you. And he says, on top of that, sell what you have. Go ahead, sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, nor neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is the biggest takeaway, is this passage. Keeping our heart right. Preparation is a good thing. By and large, in general, it's wise to be prepared. Let's be prepared. But let's, let's focus the majority of our time in preparation of the things that matter most. Our heart with God. Preparing to preach the gospel. Preparing to work hard for the Lord. Preparing to do all those things. Be a hard worker. Don't be lazy. And then when you're done with all of that, you can prepare the physical needs that, that whatever is left over to, to be able to, you know, save up for, for whatever disaster you want to save up for. Get the priority and the order right. And everything, everything else will work itself out. God will order your steps. You trust in the Lord. We don't need to live in fear. I know I don't, I'm not afraid of the, of the tribulation at all. I'm not worried for a second that I'm going to run, like just die of, of a famine. We're probably going to die from, a, from being martyred. I'm not going to fear that either. If anything, I rejoice over it. Because that's a lot of rewards. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to go. I'm telling you what, in God's, in God's economy, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. I'm a, you know, I, I don't have, I've got some food. I've got extra food. You know, I, I've been without a, a, you know, my career job other, outside of pastoring. I've been, I've been outside of work for a long time. I had some preparation, not enough to last us as long as we've been without. It would have been nice to have more, 
But you know what? God's also blessed us and made it possible not only to take care of us, to allow us to move here. And a move is not cheap to get all this stuff done. God has blessed us to do everything that we've done to this point and, and more abundantly. And, and I think it's because I, I'm trying to stay focused on doing the right thing and not being so caught up in all these other things because I could have gotten afraid of that too. I could have gotten scared and be like, oh man, what am I going to do? How am I going to support my, what am I, how am I going to do all this stuff? I want to keep working. But keep the focus right and keep it, keep the, the, the main thing, the priority. Maybe one day I'll have stuff stocked up. Maybe I won't. I don't know. Probably not. But I'm not worried about it. I'm really not. I'm going to spend the vast majority of my time getting worried about these, this other, you know, the main thing. And the other stuff is just kind of fun. I, I think it's kind of fun looking at the vaults and looking at the things that are, I think it's cool. I think, I think it's interesting. It's kind of fun, but it's nothing that I'm going to just, just let that eat up all of my time and, and spend all my focus on. So anyways, I ho hopefully that helps, you know, get, just getting the right perspective. And again, I'm, I'm trying, I'm not trying to say that any of this stuff, like it's, it's, it's not a sin to be, to, to put away some, to have some storage and food storage and stuff like that. It's, it's fine. But don't get distracted from what we're here to do. That's the main point. Don't get distracted from it. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom that you teach us in the Bible. And God, I thank you for making the promises that you make on caring for us and making sure that your children will be fed and will be clothed if we choose to, to serve you and, and do what's right. I thank you for that. That's a, that's a big relief off of our minds to, to not have to be worried about everything so much, but that we could worry about the things that you tell us to be worried about and concerned about the things you tell us to be concerned about. And if we do that, there's, there's nothing else left for us to be, to be um, fretting about. God, thank you for this church. I thank you for everyone here. I pray that you would please just bless our church and help us to continue to do works and, and to improve on what we're doing, especially if we do end up going through the tribulation time. God, help us all to be strengthened here and to not back down, but to do great exploits for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.